Sonic, the heart of your system. I'm Leo Wood for Kick Guru. This motherboard is the MSI Meg Z390 Godlike. Meg, uh, that's Enthusiast Gamer. Z390, obviously the chipset. It's for the latest 9th gen Intel processors. Godlike, because it's right at the top of the product stack. As in, it is priced at one penny under £600. 600, 599999. You can find it discounted in the UK to about £550. I think it's still on pre-order at this moment. Uh, but that still means it is double the price of the Gigabyte Z390 Aorus Master or the MSI Meg Z390 Ace. They're about £290-odd. Pounds. Double the price. Now, granted, you do get some uh, add-in PCI Express cards and you get decent Wi-Fi with the godlike, but what on earth do you get for all that money? This requires a close inspection. The brief overview of this uh, godlike board is that it comes with just everything you could possibly want. It's an E80X form factor, therefore it's stretched this away, and it comes with these various accessories. So there's the antenna for the Wi-Fi that obviously connects to the I.O. Here we have a riser card to add two more M.2s to the uh, three slots you already get. For example, there, if you install that in one of the slots, it obviously cuts off bandwidth from the processor for the other slots because uh, our ninth gen or indeed eighth gen only has so much bandwidth. And then we have this streaming boost capture card HDMI input for gamers who want to capture extra devices and show off multiple streams on Twitch or some such. Okay, fair enough. But do those people really want all the overclocking features? That's really my question here. If you're doing a kind of video processing uh, game streaming thing, how much overclocking do you want to do? We have got a lot of overclocking features. We've got two 8-pin EPS connectors, we've got the main 24-pin uh, obviously, and then we've got a 6-pin for uh, graphics for extra power. There is no graphics card on the market today that requires extra juice to be fed to the slot. That is a serious overclocking feature. We've got fan headers galore, including two here, because this uh, PCH uh, shroud, it extends hugely. I mean, that actually extends there. This is a separate shroud. But the, the plastic armour, it goes all over the place. Uh, around the top of the board, so we've got fan headers there. We've got RGB connectors, just as you'd expect. Uh, going down the side, we've got USB 3.1 Gen 2s times 2, which is a good thing to see. We've got USB 3.1 Gen 1s or USB 3.0s if you prefer laid down there. So a lot of USB going on right there. We've got SATA. Uh, we've got U.2. Why? Good question. Feels to me like they're basically putting everything into the mix and just giving you all the features. Across the bottom, we've got your, well, really these are controls for using on the test bench, so your power and reset, for example. Uh, but we've also got their game boost uh, function. Uh, this is something, this is for overclocking. The idea is you uh, click up, you know, the, the speed. Um, I did uh, some checks and uh, that will in addition to clicking up the speed of 100 megahertz at a time, it also bumps up the voltage. So if you put the gain boost uh, on zero, it's auto. Go to one, 1.25 volts, and then go all the way around to 11, and you go up in increments to 1.475 volts, which is just mental. Uh, so we have headers and connectors galore uh, for overclocking, uh, which we will see when we go into the BIOS, but this definitely gives the impression that this is an extreme overclockers board. Around the side, we've got the extreme audio. The I.O. is a curious thing. So we've got uh, BIOS flashback clear CMOS. That's obviously for getting out of trouble. We've got the Wi-Fi. We've got a PS2, which is an overclocking feature because extreme overclockers often find that USB dies when you get to very high speeds. So you need a PS2 to give you control. Uh, various USBs, uh, so that's all good. Dual Ethernet, we've got audio, and then we've got a quarter inch headphone jack. I don't know of any extreme overclocker who requires PS2 who also wants a headphone jack. That I do not understand. Also, when we turn the board back around here, we see this connector just here, which is labeled Corsair. The idea of that is that you can connect your Corsair node RGB lighting system directly to the motherboard and then control it through the MSI software rather than using Corsair Link or IQ. Stripping down the godlike is actually quite straightforward. You just undo a bunch of screws and pull off the various covers and behold, you have a bare board. And what you see is that the 18 phases are 16 plus two. 
the 16 phases for the V core uh, because you don't have to worry about graphics on this board. There are no graphics outputs on the I.O. panel. The 16 phases, therefore, are the uh, eight phases of the controller doubled up to give you 16. The doublers are on the back of the board. Those phases are rated at 60 amps each uh, times 16. That's one heck of a lot of current. And you're never going to need a fraction of that current for a Core i9-9900K, let alone a lesser ninth gen CPU. Returns to that thought that this is a board for the extreme overclocker. The obvious problem, not that I've mentioned it in this review yet, but have in previous reviews, is that the i9-9900K is not an extreme overclocking CPU. It basically arrives at its limits. All of those phases are used by the CPU, that means that you have a separate controller and VRM phases by monolithic power for the DDR4. Going down the board, it becomes apparent there is no PLX chip, so you only get the PCI Express that comes with your 9th gen CPU and the PCH. The thing is that we understand that a PLX chip costs at least 50 bucks, maybe even 70 bucks. So adding PLX, adding extra PCI Express is a really expensive procedure. And the truth is most people can use one graphics card, maybe two. They don't need the extra PCI Express, even though you get those add-in cards supplied with the godlike package. So this begs the question, why are there so many PCI Express slots? Personally, I think the time has come for boards such as this high-end uh, model to be narrower a regular ATX width and then lose some PCI Express slots to give space below the graphics card for all these uh, features. Move them around a tad. The layout at the moment doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You are not going to populate all of those PCI Express slots, certainly not with graphics cards. I mean, Nvidia just won't allow it these days. Uh, so one graphics card, maybe two. You don't need a PLX chip. You save the money, which is ironic considering the colossal cost of this motherboard, but if there's PLX, it'd be far more expensive. But the layout, therefore, to my mind, doesn't make a lot of sense. There are too many expansion slots. You are simply not going to use them. The good news here is that the VRMs look really solid. We enter BIOS setup. We're in easy mode here. Easy mode. Okay, two big buttons top left, hardware control for the game boost button. If I toggle that, it goes to software and we're now picking a function by uh, within the BIOS, but hardware means you have to click that uh, knob at the foot of the board around. And if we look here, you can see what will happen. So uh, what, uh, zero is game boost disable, i.e. auto, one 5.1 1 gigahertz maximum turbo, two 5.2 and so on and so forth, up to number 11, maximum 5.7 gigahertz for an i9 9900K. Just not gonna happen, just isn't. XMP, simple button, and there you are, and the rest of the bits and pieces are all dead straightforward, but fan info, at least it looks pretty, so let's have a little look at that. Nice, and hardware monitor there, similarly. That's all good, okay. Then we switch into advanced mode. Motherboard settings, so you've got all the bits and pieces you'd expect to see, integrated peripherals, uh, storage and so on and so forth. Overclocking settings. Now then, XMP is already enabled because I've done it on that big button there, so we haven't got to worry about that. You can go down there, so within DRAM configuration you've got all the memory timings, just as you'd expect. Digital power, which I think must be a little joke. There is load line calibration. Took me a while to find it for some reason, don't know why. And over here we have a, a little schematic showing you what will happen at each stage. And we can see there by going to three, uh, we can see that three is towards the top because you're not necessarily sure which way up it goes. Therefore one is the top auto back to how we were. And we can go through there and we've got a little working guide on the right hand side, little hints. So that's useful. Continuing down, CPU voltage and such like. Uh, do you want, uh, basically what mode do you want? Do you want to punch in a number or do you want to offset is the broad speaking thing there. CPU core voltage, therefore you then put a number in and the same for the other voltages. That's all straightforward. Flashing the bias, obviously. Hardware monitor, we've seen this already in the simple version, the easy version, my mistake. And then Board Explorer. This is quite cute in that when you mouse over the different parts, they, they uh, are illuminated in red to show you which parts you can actually find information about. Uh, go over there and you can see what processor is uh, installed. 
and similarly for your memory. The only SSD I have in this system is an M.2, which is under there, so that's quite correct. There's actually nothing going on over this side whatsoever, so it's red, but there's nothing to tell me. Uh, so that's all accurate. Uh, it does make you kind of wonder why you'd want that for an extreme overclocker, but hey-ho, it's graphical, it works, it's perfectly pleasant. Uh, so we've enabled XMP, and that's all we've done. We save. And we're going to Windows. I tested the godlike with some G-Skill Sniper X DDR4-3400 16GB dual channel, reference uh, RTX 2080, that's Founders Edition, and a Fractal Design Celsius S24 liquid cooler. That's a 240mm Ace Tech. There's a 1TB WD Black M.2 under one of those covers, power supply, Seasonic Prime Platinum 1300W. The same test setup as I've used for my last couple of uh, Core i9 reviews. So we have the same platform. I overclocked to 5 GHz and used an AVX offset, which was 4.7, as that seemed to keep the thermals happy. Uh, and there was basically nothing to report. It steams along through benchmarks entirely. Happily, the figures are exactly where you'd expect them to be because, and this is the point, the limitation is the Intel processor. The Z390 chipsets, the power regulation as such, like it's all decent quality stuff, it all delivers the performance you would expect. Pushing the processor beyond 5 gigahertz, it can be done. You can go to 5.1. I'm talking about all cores rather than a one core turboing. But the temperatures go up and up and up. Uh, and we've covered this a few times already, but basically, as far as I'm concerned, once the temperatures are hitting in the 80s, you're in the territory. Once you hit 90, it's not good. 100, I just, I, I can't stand that. The idea of paying 600 pounds for a processor and running it close to 100 Celsius, uh, it just makes, chills me to the bone. So, five gigahertz it was, AVX offset 4.7, performance exactly where I'd expect it to be because of the processor. And the temperatures, I've, I've benchmarked another MSI motherboard I haven't yet reviewed, I will be, that is the MSI Meg Z390 Ace. So that's a uh, just under 300 pound, slightly inferior VRMs to this, but basically it's a high-end uh, enthusiast motherboard without being this hurrah, massively over the top uh, board such as the Godlike is. The Meg Z390 Ace is similar to the Gigabyte Z390 Aorus Master that I've already reviewed, or I've done the video for. Uh, VRMs are similar, the pricing is similar, the spec is similar. Those are 300 pound boards, which obviously is quite a lot of money in you know, the great scheme of things. They perform in a very similar fashion, except that the Gigabyte has better VRMs, better cooling on the VRMs. This godlike performs better than the Meg Ace that you haven't yet seen, uh, but it doesn't perform as well in terms of VRM temperatures as the Gigabyte. Having said that, the Gigabyte has got the most stupendous cooling, uh, really good quality stuff. So uh, at the basic level, running a processor at five gigahertz, the Godlike delivers. It does a decent job, but then at this sort of money, it should do just a, a stellar job. It doesn't match the Gigabyte. What else can it do? Now, this is where it gets either aggravating or interesting, depending on your point of view. If you're going for extreme overclocking, if you want to use LN2 or some such, well, fine, good luck to you. I don't do LN2, I'm not interested. Uh, I'm interested in proper cooling. Uh, 240mm only one on this is just for convenience. I'm happy to use custom loop, but my experience with custom loop so far is that the Intel processor is limited just because it's so dense in terms of the heat it produces. So, Going to a custom loop will give you an advantage, but not a huge advantage. Certainly not one that requires another £300 worth of motherboard. If you're going to LN2, okay, maybe, but that's a different game. If you're going to LN2, however, do you really want a uh, an HDMI input capture card? Do you really need five M.2s? Do you need uh, all the bells and whistles? Do you need this rather cutesy LCD display on here, which uh, we've seen something similar with um, uh, Asus ROG? Uh, no, you don't, is the short answer. Indeed, you want less stuff. You want less bells and whistles. You want two memory slots. You want fewer PCI Express, probably. You want to take stuff away. You certainly don't want a quarter-inch audio jack. Uh, if you're going for extreme overclocking, the vast majority of what I can see here, you just don't you want to strip it back to the basics. So extreme overclocking, LN2, not my game. 
this board just doesn't feel like an extreme overclocker board. I have no doubt that gamers will get all of the functions and all the performance they require from a motherboard that costs half the price of the godlike. £300, as far as I'm concerned, is the ceiling that you need to spend on a high-end Z390 motherboard unless it offers some exceptional, like integrated liquid cooling, something like that. Uh, as things stand, this board is colossally expensive, and the reason it's so expensive is because it's packing in so many features. As a wise man said to me quite recently, it's the Swiss Army knife approach, which is you put in 20 tools into one device, and you end up with a thing that's not a particularly great corkscrew, not a particularly great knife, but it does have a thing for getting stones out of the hooves of horses. Not that I've ever had to do that in my life. So I'm disappointed. The Godlike is a very good motherboard, but it packs in so many features that it just becomes almost nonsensical. The idea that an extreme overclock with LN2 wants all this RGB makes absolutely no sense to me. But a large part of the problem is that Intel has let down the motherboard manufacturers by delivering 9th gen so close to the limits of what those CPUs can do that there is just zero, well, very little headroom for overclocking. So the idea of buying an extreme overclocking motherboard for those processors just makes no sense to me and certainly not at this extreme price. If you like this video give it a thumbs up, click to subscribe, we'll let you know about new videos as they become available, do give us a thumbs up because that's just nice isn't it. Uh, I'm Leo Wood for Kit Guru. this is the MSI Meg Z390 Godlike.